So this video is about the Silurian period. Particularly in learning about and making this video, I'm trying to get a better sense of the life situation during this period, while taking a particular focus on something that I've neglected when speaking of the Cambrian and far more significantly the Ordovician, namely the movement of life onto land. The paper I found most helpful in this regard I left the link to below, and I also linked the podcast episode I found helpful for a basic overview of life at the time. Before approaching land life and some of the rest of Silurian life, let's get a basic sense of the situation at Earth's surface. The Silurian period saw a layout of the continents with the massive continent of Gondwana in the south, and over and near the equator you have Laurentia, which consists of North America, Greenland, and a sliver of Europe, Baltica, Northern Europe, and Avalonia, the east coast of North America, and a little of Europe again. So these three players were continuing their collision course and then began colliding, which would continue into the Devonian to form your America. No, your America. And Siberia, or Angara, opted out of joining that club. The massive ocean dominating the northern hemisphere is the Panthalassic, and on the south you've got minor oceans. With the temperature having warmed in the tail end of the Ordovician, after the preceding Hernanchian glaciation, the Silurian, generally, saw a world where the temperature was warm and fairly stable, and shallow water covered a vast expanse of the continents. But not only inside the water, but also alongside some of that water, there was life. And much of that life evolved during this period, and maybe some of the life initially moved to land during this period. A major element often stressed in presentations on the Silurian is this transition of plant and animal life to land. And the record of that does indeed pick up significantly in this period. Sometimes neglected in this narrative, however, is that microbial life had been on land for a very long time at this point, and the basal plants also appear to have preceded this period. Fungi likely did as well, and it may be that animals did too. Let's take a closer look at the story, but before we do, I just want to make one disclaimer about landed life in this period. You shouldn't imagine that life is covering the continents, or anything resembling that. As best I'm aware, all life during this period existed near water and in moist environments. First, microbes. Microbes had moved to land by at least a billion years ago, and likely a lot earlier. And some of these microbial mats and crusts were still around, living their lives in the Silurian, when our story of land plants and other life moving to land was already well underway. And while not going back as far as microbes on land do, land plants themselves almost assuredly started their story earlier than the Silurian as well. The evidence for pre-Silurian land plants doesn't come from fossil plants themselves, but rather from their spores, which appear first in the Middle Ordovician and continue through the Silurian and beyond. And interestingly, the earliest spores are all from Gondwana. There's another interesting thing about the history of these early land plant spores, and that's that Endordovician mass extinction event, which we learned about in the previous video, well, the fossil spores we're talking about continue through this period and beyond without any signs of being hit. And instead, they're continually increasing in diversity. As for fossils of the plants themselves, those start appearing in the late Silurian, the most famous of which is Cooksonia, a semivascular plant dating to the Wenlock epoch, which reproduced with spores from its sporangia. The coming period of the Devonian would see a far greater diversification of plant life. Now to consider fungi, most alleged pre-Silurian evidence for fungi are controversial, though there is a somewhat more accepted late Ordovician specimen of Tortatubus protuberans. The Silurian sees far more evidence of fungi on land in the fossil record, such as the spores and filaments from the late Silurian in sandstone of the Bergsvik beds in Gotland, Sweden. Now, onto the animals. Evidence for animals on land prior to the Silurian remains uncompelling to many, though persuasive to some, and molecular clock studies currently indeed suggest an earlier entry than the Silurian, and of course, some of the ambiguous remains that we do have, such as alleged Cambrian arthropod traces and Ordovician annelid burrows, may indeed actually be from land animals. 
But in the late Silurian, the evidence is clearer through numerous avenues, including the cuticles of a number of landed arthropods, including two centipedes and an arachnid. As for other life during this period, we're going to take a look at the reef building scene and then consider independently some of the arthropods and fish. First, the reef builders. Corals are killing it in some places and are oddly absent in others during this period. The tabulid and rugose corals, having come to be in the Ordovician, are still around, some species having made it through the end Ordovician extinction, and they're flourishing along with the other main reef builder, the stromatoporoids, which are an extinct clade of sponges. Keep in mind that modern corals are not of these tabulid or rugose varieties, rather they are sclerentinian corals and they don't yet exist. The beautiful crinoids are still around, as are brachiopods. Now to consider some players in the arthropod scene, ignoring those previously mentioned land colonizers. The trilobites were still kicking, though not at the level of diversity they'd seen in the Ordovician, but they're still very much players in this biosphere. Some other arthropods, meanwhile, were becoming apex predators. The Silurians saw the rise of a different apex predator than the prior Ordovician and Cambrian. In the Cambrian, we had monsters of the Anomala Carids, and the Ordovician saw apex predators from amongst the Nautiloids, who remained a significant player in the Silurian. And now, having gotten their evolutionary advent in the late Ordovician, the Silurian sees the rise of the new apex predator Eurypterids, the largest of which growing to some 7 feet long. While you'd be able to comfortably squash some smaller species of Eurypterids on their foot, enjoy playing around with that 7-foot fella. The Eurypterids peaked in diversity in the Ensilurian, Predoli Epoch, and continued to flourish into the Devonian. Fish. We'll only consider the Silurian newcomers here. The fossil record of the early Silurian sees the appearance of placoderms amongst the fishes. These are armored fish with no internal skeleton, the most complete example of which is reconstructed in this image of the early Silurian Silurolepus. The early Silurian also sees our first recorded Acanthodians, and you're seeing on screen the oldest near-complete Acanthodian on record, Nerepus acanthus of the middle Silurian. And later on, we have our first Osteichthys, or bony fish, appearing in the late Silurian with Goyo oneros being our earliest known one from around 425 million years ago. And it's generally thought that from the Osteichthians will come our first tetrapod ancestors making their way onto land. The story of fish will take off in a big way in the coming period, the Devonian, which is actually sometimes called the Age of Fishes. So the Silurian saw life continue in the seas and diversify some, and it also sees a relatively soft continuation of the story of life on land, and this development is particularly soft in contrast to what's to come. The next topic I move to come to better understand about the history of everything is continuing this exploration of life in the Paleozoic era with the next period, the Devonian, so that'll be the next video.